Did you ever try to focus on a target and found that your focuser just couldn't do it? It's not that the focuser itself wasn't working well, but rather that the software couldn't really differentiate between the stars and the hazy material in the background that is the stuff of the nebulae, or in this case, the central haze generated by the overwhelming light of the core star clusters. This cluster was particularly bad for that problem because this is NGC 7078, one of the most densely packed star clusters in the Milky Way galaxy, and its core has already gone through collapse, meaning that many of its stars have migrated into very close positions at the center of the star cluster. Right now, you are seeing the fully developed version, and I have developed it specifically to reveal as many of the individual stars in the core as possible. But, undeveloped, this entire region, circled in red, pretty much just looks like a big haze of light, especially as far as the focusing software is concerned. And with targets like globular clusters like these in certain galaxies, your focusing software may have problems. Well, there is a way around that. All you have to do is put a hole in your focuser. A virtual hole, one which, if you are using Nina, is simple to accomplish. Here you can see a representation of such a hole. The outer yellow box is the outer crop, and the inner yellow box is the inner crop. The numbers displayed are HFR values, and their presence indicates that Nina has seen and measured the stars beside them. Nina and its autofocuser will only see and measure what is between the two crop boxes. Setting this up is easy. We go over to the icon tab in the left column and click on options. And then, in the column that appears just to the right, click on the autofocus tab. Here, you'll see the two key lines to adjust. The outer crop ratio on the upper left side, and the inner crop ratio on the upper right side. To get the donut effect in the middle, you'll need to bring in the outer crop ratio a little bit, it doesn't matter how much. I usually just put 0.9, which will tell the autofocuser to ignore the outer 10% of the image, but you can enter whatever value you need to. And then in the inner crop ratio box, this is where you're going to pick how much of the central area that you want the Nina autofocus software to ignore. For example, if you were to type in 0.1, you would see a small inner crop box appear that would designate that Nina is going to ignore the inner tenth of the image. And if you entered 0.2 in the inner crop ratio, the box that would appear would be twice as large and indicate that the Nina autofocus software will ignore the inner 20% of the image. So I have set the outer crop for 0.9. This means that Nina will ignore the outer 10% of the image or anything beyond the outer crop box. And I've set the inner crop box for 0.3, meaning that Nina will ignore anything in the inner 30% of the image or anything within the inner crop box. Basically, this creates a focus donut, except the donut is square. And the Nina autofocuser will only attempt to focus on anything inside the donut. Now to see the crop boxes and what stars will be assessed, in the inner column, you need to go up to the imaging tab here, and then go over to image options and turn on annotate image. Then go back over to your image tab and shoot a test image, and then you will be able to see the crop donut. Something else that can be a little confusing is that when a focus routine starts, the crop boxes and annotations will disappear. But, as long as you have them set, they're still active. Now the Nina sequence is nearly finished shooting this final luminance sub. When it's finished, it will switch to the red filter. And I have the sequence set to refocus every time a filter is changed. So in a few seconds, we can watch it apply this cropped or donut hole filtering strategy and see if that gets us to focus. By the way, Nina was refusing to focus on this DSO before I set the crop in the middle. And that's what got me thinking, oh, I should make a video on how to do this. I think many persons using Nina don't even know its autofocus offers this feature. But I did not even think to screen capture the focus failure. Trust me, it failed. But now it's going to work. In fact, it's already worked. That's how it is that Nina has been able to complete the luminance part of the sequence. All right, it's going to switch to the red filter now. Dither, make sure the DSO is centered as I have framed it in the framing tab, and then begin the autofocus sequence now. My autofocus shots are six seconds long, and notice how, as soon as it shoots the first shot, your focus donut, the cropped area, vanishes from the screen. The Nina autofocus feature is applying it, you just can't see it. I don't know why it does this. It's a little disconcerting if you're new at it. I know it confused me at first. Maybe Nina just wants to apply all of what it assumes a mini PC's limited processing power is to autofocus, but it does that, so just accept it. It's still applying your designated autofocus region. I'll go ahead and speed through the rest of the sequence. It's pretty standard from here. Now 
Power DSO is perfectly in focus using the ZWO LRGB RED filter. And the rest of the sequence will go ahead and shoot as normal. I'm going to shoot this DSO until it reaches the horizon, which I define at 15 degrees in my location since I live in a dark sky area and don't have to really worry about things setting into city lights. I think I shot this target for about 4 hours, which gave me 200 subframes, of which about 3% were called due to satellites, and about 25% more were called in PixInsight subframe selector due to not meeting my standards for sharpness. And that remaining 150 or so subs were then stacked in PixInsight's weighted batch preprocessor, and developed with a specific goal, as I mentioned earlier, of revealing as many stars as possible within the very bright center of this old and large globular cluster, which has already gone through a process of core collapse, which places many of the stars near its core, making the center very, very bright indeed. Let's take a look at one more quick example of the execution of this technique, this time on a galaxy. This is NGC 2093, and I can tell you now the final developing is not going to come out super because I filmed this during a full moon. And since galaxies often have a lot of haze and gas within them, those kind of things tend to be obstructed by moonlight. But I don't think we should let the moon stop us from enjoying astrophotography, and I like to challenge myself by shooting objects during the full moon and seeing how far and well I can push the processing. And this was the next target I shot after NGC 7078, the previous globular cluster. And just like with the globular cluster, the autofocus feature does not want to focus when the galaxy is also considered part of the image, and for the same reason that it was having trouble focusing on the globular cluster. I'm just going to go ahead and turn on annotate image again, and then set the inner and outer crop for the same parameters as I used on the globular cluster, 0.9 for the outer crop and 0.3 for the inner crop. In order to view the inner crop box and make sure that the galaxy region is adequately excluded, I need to shoot another frame, so I'll do that now. And when the new frame comes up, the crop boxes will be displayed, along with the stars inside the crop donut that will be measured. There's the annotation display. Anything inside the inner crop box is excluded, so we can see the galaxy has been removed from the focusing process. Now, let's go ahead and run autofocus. To the autofocus software, the galaxy is simply a big amorphous blob of light that it can't resolve into individual stars. It can't make sense of it. So, just as with the globular cluster, it was excluded from the region the autofocus will consider. Note how once again, as soon as the first autofocus frame is shot, the cropped region once again vanishes. Don't let that worry you. The autofocuser is still excluding that region from consideration. I'll go ahead and speed through the rest of this process. Just as before with the globular cluster, when the portion of the image that is creating problems is removed from what the autofocus software calculates, the autofocuser works fine. And the regions that will always make problems are those bright, hazy, amorphous regions where the autofocus is struggling to determine, hey, is this a star that I can't bring into focus or is this something else? And the best way to deal with those regions is just remove them from the autofocuser's calculation with the crop tool. The crop tool does have a weakness. You can only either remove the central area of the image by making the inner crop tool bigger and bigger, excluding more and more of the center region, or you can exclude the outer region around the outer crop tool. So if you were shooting a broad nebula where there was one clear patch off center of the region that you want to shoot, you wouldn't be able to use the crop tool to set a cropped area just around that one region, like in this illustration, for example. As always, thank you for watching. If you have any thoughts, questions, or observations, please leave them in the comments section below. And the next time that you're having difficulty shooting a, an amorphous DSO, such as a galaxy with haze around it or a globular cluster, if you happen to be a Nini user, you can just define your focus area by creating a virtual donut. Now, get out there and shoot that wonderful sky.